Good morning, Royal We Fellowship. Shabbat Shalom and happy Saturday to you. We are going to continue on this morning in our journey following Moses and the mixed multitude as they are continuing to build and they are starting to grumble because God has led them out of oppression. And it's not as easy as one would think when you leave oppression and you go into a promised land. And so we're continuing on in this journey. Today, we are in Numbers chapter 12. And so while uh, people are signing in, I'm going to go ahead and, and welcome all of you. I'm glad that you are here. And I'm going to go ahead and open up in prayer as well, and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful morning. We ask, Lord God, that you'd be with us, that you would soften our hearts before you, that you would help us to receive your word, that you would help us to understand, give us wisdom and application to our own lives, Lord. Be with us this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Once again, very happy that you are all here. Thank you for those of you who have been with us. We are following along in the journey as Moses has led people, not taken people out, but led people out of Egypt. Uh, This has been the book of uh, Exodus through Leviticus, and now we're in Numbers. And we've been watching and observing as the Lord has instructed people after taking them out of oppression. And by the way, that's what they were in. And this represents a lot of where you and I have been in oppressive relationships in our lives, whether it's narcissistically abusive family uh, dynamics or a marriage, perhaps, or uh, something that has been abusive towards you and very oppressive in your life and has stopped you for all that God wants to have for you in your life. So it's an, it's an actual representation of that. And what had to happen in order for these people to leave is God had to make things so bad on Egypt and so bad in the situation that literally the Pharaoh drove the people out. And oftentimes this is what happens in our oppressive relationships when we're dealing with narcissistically abusive people. It's not that we oftentimes choose to leave on our own, but oftentimes it gets so bad in the relationship that we are driven out. We feel purged. We can literally take it no longer. The hope and the goal is that it doesn't get to that point, that we learn to leave on our own, that we learn to get away from toxic and abusive behavior on our own. However, when God intervenes, this is what it typically looks like. The relationship becomes so bad that we are driven out. And as a result, the Lord is re teaching and re-guiding all of these people on how to live. He had to unlearn, they had to unlearn everything that they've learned, so everything they partook in in Egypt, all the things that they enjoyed, the way they ate their food, it was all wrong, and God is giving them a new understanding of things not to eat, things not to partake in, how to worship the right way, how to celebrate. And today, we're continuing on as they're still having a a hard time with a lot of the things. Now, one of the things that's interesting is they will have times where they can eat because, listen, they don't have a home as of yet. They have what's called camps, and they've been doing this for quite some time. They'll go from place to place. And I guess in a lot of ways, you can say that these people became homeless, a gigantic, large mass of homeless people. They had no state to settle in. They had no home or territory to call home. So they would go and they would camp based on what the Lord would tell them because they're making this journey. It's not easy when you leave an oppression, uh, an oppressive relationship of any kind that at one time you called it home and it was comfortable and you don't exactly know where you're going to go. And you may find yourself leaving and going from place to place. You live in this apartment, you live in that apartment, and you, you're not, it's hard, it's difficult wherever you go. This is what's taking place, except they didn't have the luxury of apartments back then. So they would just set up camps in the desert wherever they were. So at this point in time in the journey, we are currently in the book of Numbers. And the reason it's called the book of Numbers, because this is when they started to account for all the different people, all the different tribes. One of the most interesting things that we see that has been taking place is that God understands the the need for people to be separate. God understands the need for people to be divided and to be separated. There is no such thing as complete unification. It doesn't matter what president or what nation is calling for everybody to be unified. It doesn't exist because there are different 
there's different characters. There's different attitudes. There's different ways of doing things. And God recognizes this. And so what God has done in the book of Numbers is started to separate all the people within the nation of Israel, all of these people, as they're trying to find their home. He separated them by their family name. So you have the Reubenites, you have, you know, on and on and on, and allows them to unify in the sense that it's one nation, but go to their separate tribes to do things within their own tribes. Another way to look at this would be like states within a nation. So the United States is the United States, right? They're united, but states have their own separate laws. States have their own ways of operating things. This is a lot of, the idea of this anyways, comes from what I believe the biblical context is is doing, what God was doing with the nation of Israel, allowing these people to separate into their own individual tribes, okay? This way it keeps the different personalities, it keeps the different ways of doing, it's not everybody trying to do the exact same thing. So today we're going to get into... Numbers chapter 12, if you have your Bibles, open them up with me. What's interesting that we're going to find out is that last week in in Numbers chapter 11, we see that the people are starting to grumble again. They're very dissatisfied with what's taking place, and the reason is is because they don't have good food to eat, at least not in their minds. They've been eating what's called manna. As they travel, they go from place to place. They don't have time to plant seeds, to, to grow vegetation. They don't have time to hunt. They don't have time to do anything, and so they're relying on manna from heaven, which, as it described in last week, in chapter 11 of Numbers, what would happen is the dew in the morning would settle on the ground, and then they'd go out and they'd collect these little things that looked like raisins off of the ground, and it's called manna. All right, so these little things that are best described as raisins, okay, and this would be their food. Now, this is, it's an interesting thing. We do not have manna today. We don't even, we, we've never seen it. So we have to have, be under the assumption that whatever this manna was, was directly by the hands of God for these people, for this place, and for this time, which is why it's not something that we can go in the store and buy. It's not something that we can grow. It's not something, and so watch this. The reason I bring this up is because we have to then assume that manna, had every bit of the nutrition that the people needed. As a matter of fact, I would dare to say that whatever this manna was, was probably the most nutritional source of any food that any person could ever eat. Why else would God drop down this substance called manna within the dew of the ground as the only food for a nation that God is trying to develop? Why would he drop something on the ground that doesn't have every single bit of of nutrient that they need? I would say, you know, and it's interesting today, the big hype today is people going out there and trying to find power foods, right? Everybody wants the power foods and maca powder and all kinds of, there's all kinds of powders and all kinds of, uh, you know, weird stuff that you can go and put in your shakes, you know, go to Whole Foods Market or whatever, Everybody now is trying to find that super food, that super fruit, that super veggie combo. But I'm willing to, uh, I'm 100% confident that nothing compares to whatever manna was. When it comes to the idea and the concept of a super food, this was probably a food that did everything from provide the energy to keeping people youthful, whatever, everything. The problem is, is that it did not taste the way in which the people were used to tasting food back in Egypt, back when they were oppressed. It didn't taste like that juicy steak, the salty, whatever they were eating. It tasted like whatever it needed to taste like, the manna that they found on the ground. And so as a result, they began to cry and they began to grumble because they did not appreciate the nutritional value of it. They did not appreciate that God wanted to sustain them and therefore give them the best of the best that God can create as far as food goes. Instead, they were complaining because it didn't taste good. They were bored with it. 
having come out of a background in Egypt, even though they were oppressed and abused, they had steaks and they had all these foods and they had wines and they were able to get drunk. And now they're only able to eat this very nutritional thing. And so the people started to grumble. They started to complain. They started to go to Moses. They started to yell. They started to say, this sucks. And this is typically oftentimes how a lot of us, we live our lives. We can have exactly what we need, exactly what sustains us. We could have all that right in front of us, but it looks small. It doesn't look grand. It doesn't look big. It doesn't taste amazing. And so we start to complain. We start to grumble. All right. So let's continue on. Now we're going to be in the book of Numbers chapter 12. If you have your Bibles, open it up with me. Chapter 12, verse 1, Miriam and Aaron begin to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses? They asked. Hasn't he also spoken through us? And the Lord heard this. Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. So at this point in time, Miriam and Aaron began to have an issue with Moses because of one of Moses' wives. All right. Moses was a humble man, more humble than anyone else on the earth. At once the Lord said to Moses, Aaron and Miriam, come out to the tent of meeting, all three of you. So the three of them went out. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud. He stood at the entrance to the tent and summoned Aaron and Miriam. When the two of them stepped forward, he said, listen to my words. When there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, reveal myself to them in visions. I speak to them in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? This is interesting. The Lord is challenging them, saying, you know that Moses is leading you. You know that, and, and by the way, Moses is no more than just a, a mouthpiece. It's God leading people. But because Moses is so humble, and also watch this, Moses is also very distant from the people. Okay, Moses is not the type of person that's everybody's friend. He's not really hanging out and grab ass and, and whatever else that most people do in these communities. And here's why. Moses went through, for those of you who can recall how Moses even got to where he is, he went through a a terrible, traumatic life that separated him constantly from people. So he first was born and then he was put in a basket when the Egyptian people were out killing the Hebrew babies within the Egyptian territory or the territory of Egypt. The Egyptians brought him in as a baby because God put it in the, the heart of the Egyptian Pharaoh's daughter to bring Moses in. They raised him, but they knew that he was a Hebrew baby, yet they still raised him. He looked different. He, he was a Hebrew baby. They knew it. The common misunderstanding is that Moses was brought up as this Egyptian prince, that he was the prince of Egypt. Yeah, I saw that Disney movie too, and it's not true. If anything, Moses was the unwanted stepchild, the unwanted adopted child within the Egyptian palace. So he was not treated fairly. He was not treated the same as the other Egyptian children that were born in the palace. He was most likely abused and traumatized and neglected on many occasions. Okay, but watch this. This isn't the end of it. The sad reality is that then also Moses, as he grew up older, And he went and tried to connect with the Hebrew people, his own people who were also in Egypt. He couldn't resonate with them, and they hated him too. Why? Because they were all slaves. They went out during the day, did their slave work. Moses didn't have to do any of that. So Moses was almost rejected by, well, he was. He was rejected by all sides. He had the Egyptian people who hated, who looked down on him. He was the unwanted stepchild. He had the Hebrew people who were slaves who hated him because they knew he was Hebrew as well, but he didn't have to do the slave work. So do you see how Moses wasn't received or accepted by anybody? Moses most likely grew up to be a loner, very isolated. And by the way, when we look at this, 
it makes sense as to why Moses then became the perfect person for God to use. Listen, when God chooses a leader amongst people, I'm going to say this right now, when God chooses a leader amongst people, God is not looking for the person who is popular with other people. I'm going to repeat this again. If God is looking for a leader amongst people, then he's not looking for who's popular amongst people. Why would I say that? Because if God is choosing somebody who's popular amongst all people, well, then that person's going to be swayed by the opinions of wherever he's popular. God would then have to compete with the people, right? In other words, a popular person, a person who's popular with people, how's God going to get their attention? They're not going to listen to God. They're going to be doing whatever it takes to stay popular. Moses was not popular. Moses was a reject. Moses was, Moses had nobody. Moses was so rejected by, by people that by the time he ran from Egypt, he straight up ran. He ran from Egypt, which means, by the way, he didn't just run from the Egyptians. He ran from the Hebrew people too. He had nobody to talk to, nobody to turn to. He was no prince. He was a traumatized, very hurt, very isolated, very neglected individual. And by the time he ran, he was just crazy enough in this world that he was able to stand and talk to a burning bush. You want to know what it takes to meet God face to face, to talk to a burning bush? In order to understand what that's even like, you have to first understand what it's like not to have anything else or anybody else in your life. Only then can you almost be crazy enough to even stand and talk to a burning bush. You see, had Moses lived lives like most people, lots of friends, he wouldn't have paid any attention. He would have freaked out by the burning bush, ran and told his friends and started grab-assing and high-fiving people and whatever else. But he didn't. He had nobody. So this is what most people don't understand about Moses. Now watch this. There's no indication that Moses had changed. Moses is still that same person, very timid, very shy, very humble, as the Bible kindly puts it. The only communication, the deepest communication, the only true friend that Moses really has is God. And this is where God needed Moses to be in order to lead his people. God needed someone who would rely completely on him and not become friends with people. And so here we see that in this situation, and this is interesting, both Miriam and Aaron begin to talk against Moses. Chances are Moses didn't even know how to counteract it. Moses didn't even know how to stand up for himself. And so as a result, God steps into the picture. And this is where God personally meets Miriam and Aaron and saying, there is a prophet among you. This is when God speaks up for the innocent. I, the Lord, reveal myself to them in visions. I speak to them in dreams. And he challenges them at the end. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Meaning I deal with Moses directly. Moses gets to see me. We talk. Moses is my homeboy. How come you're not afraid? God is challenging them, saying, are you not afraid of me? God could, in his anger, burning against Miriam and Aaron, say, you know what? I could take all of this away from you. I could take even the, the, the manna that I've given you. You want to talk against my servant, Moses? The one person in this entire, in this entire nation that has a relationship with me while you all are trying to see who's popular amongst each other and you're trying to do whatever. But the one person who just has, who has nothing but me and and his wives, right? So the anger of the Lord burned against them and he left them. Let's see what happens. When the cloud lifted from above the tent, Miriam's skin was leprous. Miriam began to turn into leprosy. It became as white as snow. Aaron turned towards her and saw that she had a defiling skin disease. And he said to Moses, please, my Lord, I ask you not to hold against us the sin we have so foolishly committed. Do not let her be like a stillborn infant coming from its mother's womb. 
with its flesh half eaten away. So Moses cried out to the Lord, please God heal her. The Lord replied to Moses, if her father had spit in her face, would she not have been in disgrace for seven days? Confine her outside the camp for seven days. After that, she can be brought back. So Miriam was confined outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not move on until she was brought back. After that, the people left Hezeroth and encamped in the desert of Paran. Wow. I mean, that's brutal. The Lord really came down and dropped the hammer on Miriam and Aaron. It does not, the Lord is not going to, apparently in this nation, in this group, the Lord's not going to tolerate people talking ill about each other, saying harsh things. <laughs> the Miriam said some harsh, nasty things, and, and the Lord had stricken her with leprosy. I guess you could say that God wanted, was going to squash gossip before it even started. And it's interesting, it, here in the United States, gossip is a big deal. Everybody wants to gossip, families gossip, and they all get away with it. Sometimes I wish that gossipers would, in fact, be stricken with some kind of illness. Because gossip has run rampant, especially in a narcissistically abusive culture, in a narcissistically abusive nation like the one we live in. And so it's interesting to see that God within the nation of Israel was going to beat that out of them one way, shape, or form. God said, you are not going to talk ill of each other. You're not going to gossip about each other. Fascinating. With that, that wraps it up. Numbers chapter 12. Blessings to each and every one of you. Shabbat Shalom. Hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day. And we'll be back here next Saturday for uh, as we continue on in our journey of numbers. Have a great rest of your afternoon, folks. Blessings to you. If you do need one-on-one -on -one coaching or support for something that you're experiencing or going through in a toxic family or relationship, head on down, schedule some time with me. You can find the scheduling information in the description box down below. Blessings to each and every one of you. We'll see you next week. Bye.